Good afternoon. Welcome to Match Day. I'm Vince, and we have Ian. And with us today is Felipe Cardenas. Felipe, can you just say hello so we make sure you have audio? Hello. Perfect. Hello, Perfect. Great. Thank you for being here. Um, so our guest today, I think he's one of my first former players that I ever had brave enough to <laughs> come on. And uh, But Felipe, thank you for taking time uh, you know, away and uh, sharing hopefully about 15, 20, 25 minutes and share your insights. Um, and we're going to talk about your journey from, you know, being a player, right, to now you're a journalist, right? Now you're a writer and you write about the game. Um, so thank you again for being here. Coach Barker? Yeah, thank you, Felipe. It was nice chatting. I, I obviously did a little research before, saw some of the articles you've written most recently. Really, really good stuff. Really high quality content. And um, I got a few little secrets uh, before we came on air. So hopefully some of the guests will ask a few questions. Looking forward. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, no. Um, so I knew Felipe actually before he was a freshman at the high school. I was coaching because uh, my mentor uh, and the late Mike Berticelli, who is a staple of our organization, uh, just bragged about this kid coming. He's like, Vince, he goes, you, you cannot wait till you see this kid play. And he loved you. And here, you know, Felipe's not a big kid right you know he wasn't a, he was a little guy and um but my goodness he could do whatever he wanted with the ball and uh, so i remember as a freshman we we played you in a game and we were just sharing this before we went live but i thought it'd be fair for everybody else to hear so it's one of those games where it was it got it could get out of hand really easily so I had to kind of tell my kids not to score or figure out different ways for them not to score so the other team didn't just feel demolished. Um, so Felipe was freshman, and we you know, gave him a uniform to, for the varsity game, and, and I put him in the game, and I kind of gave him a look like, you know, don't score unless it's a head or a volley. And you did what you did, you know, and, and basically and you couldn't help it, right? A ball came across, he scored. It was actually a pretty good goal, if I remember. Yeah. And uh, – all the, you know, one of my senior captains looked at me and said, coach, just let it go. Because I always had a rule, nine, you're fine, 10, you're mine, right? So if we scored in double figures and it was 10, nothing, that you're mine tomorrow. Um, but I've, I've softened since I last uh, knew you and saw you. And, uh, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that's the way at least I remember it. But how do you remember it? Uh, listen, we had so much respect for you, coach. I think you were great for us at, at, at a young age. We, you know, high school soccer in the nineties was everything to us. It was like playing professionally. And yeah. as a sixth, seventh and eighth grader, we would go to high school games. We would watch St. Joe against Adams and yeah. under the lights at, at school field. And it's, it's, it's all we wanted. Um, and so to get to that level as a freshman, uh, that was one of my goals. It was, it was kind of a dream come true to, to play for, for St. Joe, to play for you as, as, a, as a member of the varsity team. Uh, and I think internally we all, we were kids, you know, but we, we all knew that we had a good coach um, in Coach Gansberg. And, and St. Joe had a history of producing good players, of, uh, of playing, you know, good soccer. Uh, and so I think we all just wanted to be part of that. Um, and I know you moved on and we all moved on. I think everyone remembers those times and like the hard practices and the, 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 the leg lifts that we would have to do if, if anyone misbehaved or anything like that. But it was all worth it. I think it was all worth it. It, it, it helped. It shaped me. It shaped me as a player. Um, and I stayed engaged. You know, it was it was something that I know that I was always the type of player that I appreciated tough love. At times, you know, like I, I, I knew I could be pushed. Um, I knew I had my limits, but I knew I could be pushed. I knew I could be motivated. Um, and if anyone told me that I couldn't do something like it was just, OK, no, I'm definitely going to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's interesting hearing your Thank you. Thank you. enthusiasm for high school soccer, Felipe, because in a world now where very often club is in the ascendancy and mm -hmm. MLS academies are dominating the youth scene at the elite level. The, the, ma the magic of high school of that era, and certainly when I came to this country in the late 80s, big crowds, connection to the, the school, connection to the community and the academics. And it's something that's still really powerful. Our high school audience is really enthusiastic, but they're, 
there's definitely other other programs now and some of those don't have quite that that mystery and that magic that high school does and certainly did a lot more back in the 90s and the 80s for sure no you're right and, and we used to get like that saint joe versus adams high school that'd be what three four thousand seem it yeah. seemed like i mean just packed football stadium um and by the way fritz uh our mutual friend uh and your old friend uh, from south yeah. bend says he's not sure how many nutmegs you had versus dynamo at the 96 indiana challenge cup final but it was close to double digits so <laughs> yeah but uh no well, thank you again for coming on and uh you know I, after you survived your freshman year with me um you went to columbia right if right. i remember yeah. you just you yeah. went for a year and and then you came back um yeah. you might that experience a little bit and then we'll, we'll get it was great i mean i i have cousins that were my age and and so we were really close and and we would Typically, every summer we would kind of switch off. Sometimes my cousins would visit Indiana, and, and we would even go to soccer camps. We went to Notre Dame camp together, uh, but really it was just a kind of an exchange. And sometimes my brother and I would go to Columbia and spend three weeks over the summer in Columbia. And around yeah, like 15, 16 years old, I again I was born in Columbia, so I always had this like connection. I I, I always wanted to. T I, I wonder what it was like to live there as 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 a young adult, right? And and so uh, I just begged my parents sophomore year. I would love to go to Columbia. And of course, my cousins are telling me, you need to come here. Like you would you love to play here. Uh, the school that I, that I went to had like uh, just a, a pristine pitch to play on uh, a history of, of good soccer. Uh, and and it was very it was strong academically. So that's what that's what my parents ultimately decided on but really i just wanted to go play soccer i'm just going to yeah. be honest like i did not want to study i just wanted to play soccer so they let me go and, and i spent my sophomore year in high school in columbia played at a high level i mean we won a high school national championship basically oh, wow. it would be equivalent of that of that um while i was playing there and it was funny because when i got there and i told people oh like i'm colombian but I, I my spanish was wasn't perfect i was i had to kind of learn it i had to get the accent uh, they weren't, they were surprised that I could play cause I was coming from the U S Yeah, and they yeah. would, they would even add like, where did you learn to play this way? And things like that. Um, and, and I remember the first gym class I went to, we played basketball and of course everyone in Indiana plays basketball. It doesn't matter <laughs> how big you are or uh, right. what, what your, your main sport is. And so I was pretty good at basketball and the basketball coach in Columbia was like, you need to play for our team. Like you will make varsity right away. And I was like, I, I want to play soccer. <laughs> and he was upset. He was like, everyone wants to play soccer. And I'm like, well, that, that's why I came. So uh, I played with some top players, guys that um, could have easily played professionally. I know I played against a school like our, our local rival in Cali, Colombia, produced some great players. I played with a couple of you know former pro pros that are now coaches in Colombia. OK. Uh, and so the, the level was high. I, I think I got better and I came back to Indiana um, just kind of like a different player. Um, and I had a different style of play, the way that Columbia played in the 90s, where if you're a central midfielder, you wanted to be on the ball all the time. You wanted to go go up to your center back and just take the ball off his foot, go to your go to the fullback and, and play one, two touch. Uh, and so that's what that's how we were taught to play there. When I came back to Indiana, I remember there was a little bit of a transition where my club teammates weren't sure what I was doing when I would stand two inches away from them and just like ask for the ball. They were like, what are you doing, man? Like, run, go run. Uh, but yeah, it was a good experience. And again, I missed you that year, you know, at St. Joe. Um, but it was a life-changing experience for me. I really fell in love with oh, yeah. the culture of the game and, and just got better overall. Well, that was the golden era too, right? I mean, yeah, it that, was. Was, that was Valderrama and Rincon. And yeah, that was, that was the golden era. Um, so let's push along. Uh, so you graduate from St. Joe and then you went to uh, went to college and you played. So where'd you go? So, I mean, my goal was always to go to Notre Dame and that was probably because of Mike Berticelli. You know, he, he really supported me from a young age. I think he probably met me when I was in sixth grade. Uh, and of course, Nino, his son was a year older than me, but he was in my, my brother's class. Uh, and so we, we played together growing up and, and, and my coach Berticelli would invite me to his, like the, the Mike Berticelli show and we would, you know, we'd do all kinds of drills. And 
Uh, and I think he just was constantly in my ear telling me that, you know, you can play, you can play at a high level, you can play in college. And similar to what we talked about with high school, like at that age, getting to college and playing in college was the dream. It was what every kid wanted. And so uh, I tr I wanted to go to Notre Dame. I did not have the grades. And and even I remember junior year with Coach Bertacelli, he's like, just get your grades up and you're coming, man. You're going to play here. Uh, and it didn't work. It didn't work out. You know, I went to Holy Cross for a year. Um, and then finally, my coach, Mike, Mike Avery, reached out to me. He was my club coach for so many years for Junior Irish. And he was at Cal State San Bernardino. And he basically just asked me, do you want to come play soccer in California? And so that's what I did. Um, so I went out there 90, 98 to 2001. Uh, yeah. And it was tough. It was a really good league. Like it was Division Two. Yeah. Uh, the national champion came out of our conference like two of the three years that I was there. So like high level. Uh, and, and I met my wife in, at that at Cal State San Bernardino. San Bernardino. So it was, it was worth the trip. Um, but yeah, I played three years of college soccer. And then really, I played at a high level adult league in LA, which I believe I didn't have a great college experience. We weren't that good. Um, and but I when I when I left and I played at a high level in, in LA with former players, former pros, that's when I really I think made a big jump. Um, and I remember, Coach, you probably remember me as as, as playing as a classic number ten. Yep, yep. You know, when I left college, I played in a back three as as a left okay. fullback, really, yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 a wing back role essentially. Uh, I had a coach that just wanted to use as, as many technical players as he could in the back, and we just kept the ball and played possession style, and it was it was a fun learning experience. So sure. ever yeah. since then, I've kind of played further back, but that happens okay. with age too. Well, yeah, you don't have to yeah you have to remind me. Um, but uh, no, so <laughs> now you work for um you know very respected um organization called the Athletic, um, and you are writing for Atlanta United, and so I'm going to bring in Mr. Barker. To ask some of those questions, but I'm just going to start off with a question. What so far to this date, what's what's been like your uh, probably favorite piece you've written about, if you don't mind sharing? Oh, gosh. Maybe oh, of course. maybe like top three or something like that. Yeah, um, there's one story that I wrote last year. Um, a player that came to Atlanta from Columbus, a good player, Justin Merrim, um, who a technical player that had fall, kind of fallen out of favor in Orlando his 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 even his transfer market value had had dipped to, to the point where he was you know worth less than a million dollars and i think he was probably like a $300,000 player his career was tanking and he came to Atlanta for a second chance and and we got together at a restaurant one time and had lunch and he just told me everything about the, his struggles and with both with with life and and soccer and injuries uh, and, and the headline of that story, I think what people forget is like the writers don't choose the headline. Our editors choose the headline. Uh, but the, the headline of that story was a quote that he told me, which was when he was in Orlando, he felt he was destroying his career. And I think when you hear professionals realize that, that they have a short window and that one mistake, one bad move, one injury can end it. Uh, it's really powerful. And so that story was kind of a, a, a a journey of how he went from being a top MLS player tanking almost in Orlando and then coming to Atlanta, getting a second chance and scoring two goals uh, in his first start. So that was a good, a good piece. And any tactical piece that I wrote uh, from the Tata Martino years, like there are so many that I loved because he was a manager that if you got him in a scrum or in a post game press conference and you ask the right questions, you ask soccer questions, he will tell you his entire strategy. He will tell you why he set up the way he did, what the fullback is supposed to do, what what he expects, what he expects a ball playing center back to do, what a modern number ten should do, and then you you can deduce, you can watch the the film and write a great tactical piece. So like that season that I covered at Atlanta United in 2018 with Tata Martino, a lot of the stories that I wrote, I look back on and say these were fun pieces to write. I think it's it's interesting the story about Miriam because we talk to youth coaches sometimes about remembering that the kids are still kids and they have lives and they go to school and they have boyfriends and girlfriends families but I think sometimes as fans we look at the players as the the guy in the shirt for those 90 minutes and we actually don't pay attention to the fact that some of them have backstories or maybe they're internationals living 
it away from their families or during covid we've been talking to some coaches whose international players have been locked in hotels essentially for four months while the pl other players have been able to go home so i like i like that story um one one question i'm kind of interested if i may i'm really impressed with what mls has been able to achieve over its relatively short history and i always struggle to understand does it see itself as a new exciting league and so is potentially a little bit more open a little bit more um brave or is it does it have to act a little bit more like a premier league or a Serie A or a bundesliga because it's projecting itself at that level so as a journalist what is what's your access like and how do they how do they treat you as a journalist that's a great question and it's it, it was another story that i was going to bring up because access to players um is when you cover an American sport is so different than what it is internationally. So, you know, after a game, we're allowed to go into the locker rooms and, and go up to a player and ask them a question. And international players are, are struck by that. Most of them don't like it. Um, mm -hmm. the, the locker room for, for instance, for South Americans and even Europeans is like a sacred place. It's not a place for, for journalists, but we're given that access. Um, the, I, I, I think it's so interesting to see international players adjust to that. Uh, and even them coming to a league that for them, perhaps in their countries, there's a stigma that Major League Soccer is not a top league. And so they're coming here and they're be, they're helping the game grow. For them, they're trying to develop and be sold on to a European club. And that to me is what MLS today is trying to be. They've gone through a lot of iterations. Some have been good, some have been bad. But I think they've landed on the fact that they want to be a selling league. They want to be a league that develops players, uh, whether they're domestic or international players, and then sells them to, to Europe for, for a big fee. Mm. I, I tend to agree with that outlook. I think they can become that type of league. Uh, but at the same time, being one dimensional can has, has really, that's been a problem for American soccer before. So, but that's where they're going. I think if you look at some of the top clubs in, in Major League Soccer, like LAFC in Atlanta, for instance, they realize that they can go to South America, find 18, 19, 20, 21 year old players that are being that are already being scouted by by Arsenal and Manchester United and Syria clubs. But they're given this opportunity. Come here to Major League Soccer. Uh, the pressure is off of you from, you know, you can go to the grocery store, you can go to the rest, uh, restaurant after a loss. But you're coming here to perhaps on a two year stint to develop, get better. It is a physical league, so it's not like it's not a cakewalk. I think that's something that people are, are, are wrong about. But they, they come here, they play well. It's becoming like a showcase for young players. And European clubs are really starting to come in and, and, and watch the games because, like you mentioned before, with COVID, now there are a lot of it's becoming like the players are cheaper here. The players are. Uh, they're they're young, they're good, they're well developed, and they're not expensive. They're not as expensive as they would be if they're coming out of South America. So I think MLS is trending towards being a development league, a selling league. But the product on the field, I think, can, is slowly, gradually getting better as well. So I I always comment that um, I I don't think I would want Jay Berhalter's job, Greg um, Berhalter, excuse me, um, because of the challenges of a country our size with the influences on the coast and players in, in Europe. Um, but in general, the implications for young Americans trying to, to, to use the league to, to springboard, but as you identify the ability for the clubs to go into South Central America and get quite established players at a relatively low price. It, to me, from the outside, it does seem that there's almost a contradiction there Mm -hmm. or a challenge to really pr produce our American players through our league if they can be passed over almost. I agree. I think that is an issue. And I've spoken to managers, I've spoken to, to technical directors and players that, especially veteran players that came into the league from college, they've told me that the game has changed so much and the league has changed so much that they're like, if I were coming into the league, I would not have an opportunity. And I think, you look at the college draft, it's slowly been, it's less relevant uh, than, it, than it ever has been. Uh, some, some teams like the Philadelphia Union just gave up all of their draft picks. That they're not interested in drafting college players. Uh, they were interested in, they, they traded them for, for cash that they can use to find international players. 
uh, or pay their current roster. So I agree. I think especially for college players, it's getting more difficult to break in right away because they're coming into a club that has established international players already playing for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, The academy system in the U.S. uh, at the professional level is still so young that it's, again, it's really difficult for clubs to produce that pipeline but it's it's what I've, it's what every club tells journalists oh we want a pop, pipeline we have a pipeline and uh, and sometimes you know i do laugh and i'm like you know it's it's sometimes it's tough for the for the biggest clubs in the world to do that to produce that uh, you look at manchester city uh you know phil foden is 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 a diamond in the rough uh because they're the type of club that they too even though they have a good academy system players coming through they're going to go out and buy the top players around the world so uh, the U S has a similar problem. And that, I do think that's something that major league soccer is working with, with the new Academy system, the development system, trying to get more players in, trying to work more closely, uh, with the club teams. But in my case, in covering Atlanta United, you know, they are a club that wants to eventually be developing their own players, bringing players up from the Academy level through, through the USL level. But right now that's just, that's, that doesn't produce results. Um, Mm -hmm. And so a team like Atlanta United, who went from winning right away to hiring a manager that they felt was going to help develop young talent, because that's what Frank DeBoer did at Ajax. He was a youth coach before he was the the first team manager. And what people forget is those four titles that he won at Ajax, some of those players were guys that he knew since they were 13 years old. And now they're playing for Barcelona. They're playing in Spain. They're great players. Uh, But that's so hard to replicate in the U S to your point, Ian. So that, that is definitely a challenge that the league has to continue to focus on. Yeah. I've, I've had the, the, the pleasure to be at Ajax a number of times and, and trying to replicate that from scratch in the American marketplace in a city like Atlanta makes at least on my level, makes no sense whatsoever. Um, yeah. You go, you drive into Ajax, the most successful Academy arguably in Europe, Mm. And you drive past half a dozen semi-pro clubs that are in the same zip code that are feeding into it. And the first team walk right by Van der Zaar and Overmars and, and Burkamp and all these guys. It's a, it's a different place. Yeah. Um, we do have a, a, we'll have a question, real quick question at the end um, about your thoughts about Philadelphia Union for our 11-year-old fan. I love Alex. to talk the Union. I love talking the Union. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, what do you see... Um, in terms of expansion and and once we're past all of the the global pandemic do you think the league is expanding at an appropriate level how do you see the quality because i think that's always a challenge right maintaining quality while you pursue franchise fees for the head up for the front office and all those kind of things so what do you think about expansion in general i think it's i'm on the fence i mean i can see the benefits to to the league as in general i mean now the the expansion fees have gone, I think it's, it's up to, I don't know, between 20, $30 million, $300 million, just to, to 300 million to get a club to start a club. Mm-hmm. Um, so clearly there, there, it is a financial mm-hmm. benefit to, to the, to the league. I think the, the, the goals to get to 30 teams um, eventually, and they're going, they're going to do that. No doubt about it. And listen, like there are markets that deserve to have, first, you know, top flight soccer, like St. Louis is, is, is clearly a market that is historically known for producing players and coaches and, and has, has a culture, an American soccer culture. Uh, and so they're going to get a league, you know, Charlotte is coming into the league in 2021, I believe. And they're, they, they're very open about wanting to follow the, the Atlanta United model, which was building a team right away, bringing a top manager, having a stadium, an ownership group that will spend on players. So if if that's the case, I, I'm, I, I believe in it. I support it. But that's not always the case with expansion. There are still ownership groups that just want to kind of get in the league and and and, and toe the line. And, and listen, MLS is sometimes criticized for the parity, but uh, and that's where a lot of ownerships tend to stay. But, you know, I think expansion, if it produces better football, and better players and and it showcases talent and and you're getting you know capacity crowds and and the product on the field is good then of course like bring it on but 
I think we all know that too much of anything is 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 not great. And I think they, I think they'll stop at 30. Um, and eventually, you know, who knows? MLS may be forming a relationship with Liga MX in Mexico to, to continue mm-hmm. to, to to share knowledge and, and you know have partnerships with those teams, play each other. You know, now with COVID, you know, I think you're going to start to see more players coming over from Mexico, which will eventually strengthen the product here in in America. Yeah, yeah. I one of the things I would love to see as a, as a fan of the league and a season ticket holder is the is the is geographical proximity, which isn't right. really assisted by only thirty. But if we had St. Louis, a three hour drive, which is still a very long drive for for a European for a genuine derby would be kind of fun. I mean, we get Minnesota fans come in pretty good numbers. That's six and a half hour drive. Um, but, you know, our rivalries are theoretically Chicago, Columbus. They're not exactly, right. you know, an afternoon drive and then back home in time for supper. Um, <laughs> but I, I have, I've been um, a season ticket holder for eight years and I've seen, I mean, I've seen some of the big name players come through that we've had, obviously Zlatan played here and, yep. Lampard, but some of the best players I've seen are, are the younger um, players that have either come from Europe to, to build their career. I was talking about um, Ilya Sanchez, who plays yes. for Sporting. But some of the young South Central Americans are really, really talented players and are much more fun as a, as a somewhat knowledgeable fan to watch than some of the, what you know, back in the day when it was kind of people at the end of their careers. So, Correct huge advocate for bringing in fresh talent as opposed to rerun talent for sure. And you're saying Things. that like ownership groups quickly, I'll say is that, you yeah. know, there's something that us as journalists, we, we criticize um, and, and not again, it's, it's just because this is the way the sport is played in this country, but teams here spend money on attackers. And, and, and I think, you know, defensively, you don't see great defenders. You don't see there, there, I think there've been maybe 10 in the history of MLS, 10 designated players that have been defenders. Um, and, and so sometimes if you're kind of a, a student of the game that you can watch an MLS match and be like, well, like the defending is not great. But I think as a product, that's another thing that MLS wants to become. They want the product to be good. They want the show. Right. And, you know, when I talk to Latin American players that come here, that's what they recognize about playing in America. Like everything is big, you know, everything's a show, you know, they want goals. They want, they want flair. Yep. Uh, and, and to your point about central Americans, I think on the flip side, they're coming here, they're getting better. And then they go play for their national team. And they're, you know, here in CONCACAF, the, the level, the, the, the U S is no longer running away with, 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 right. a, with mm-hmm. the, in the region. So it's, it's interesting because the, the, the detractors will say, well, MLS is, is helping produce and strengthen our CONCACAF opponents and not producing better American players. But that's mm-hmm. something that I think the league will have to, to live with. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, Felipe, you've been very gracious with your time so far. Just a quick question. Uh, Casey, who is Alex's dad, the 11 year old, uh, wants to know about your opinion about Philadelphia Union's chances and can they, carry their tournament tournament success over to the regular season. Listen, I, the union is a team that I, I think has gradually earned a lot of respect in MLS and, and Jim Curtin deserves a lot of that uh, credit because, you know, he's been on the hot seat for a long time in MLS. Uh, when, when Ernie Stewart was the technical director, he, you know, he, he believed in him and he believed in the, in the, in the model at, at Philadelphia, which, they have one of the best academies in the U.S. They they do know how to produce players. The academy set up there is top level, top notch, and I think it was a wait and see approach to like how can they get to the point where they're bringing up some youth players and then adding some international players. And so the union has finally done that. And what I like about them is that they have a clear identity. And some of the things that both you and Ian have said about some of the the challenges of, of soccer in America and, and geographically even. For MLS clubs, it's so hard for them to, to to establish an identity, a brand of football, and then stick to it because the the rosters turn over. You know, you're playing in a in a hundred degree weather, and then you're playing in altitude. Uh, the travel is is just it's too much. You know, you, your your managers are constantly having to to deal with the effects uh, of, of travel and weather. But the union have a clear identity. They play in kind of an old school four four two diamond formation that is very 90s uh no, it's not considered modern football but 
I believe that if you have the personnel to do it, it really works. And they do. They've clearly worked on it. You can see it in matches when you watch it. And now they have some really great young players like Brendan Aronson, a teenager who is a traditional classic number 10, which is, is those are hard players to find. Uh, and he's playing at a high level and he's getting looked at by a European clubs. So they're no longer this team that, that sneaks up on people to answer your question, Casey. I think they are one of the favorites now in this MLS is back tournament. They're playing well, they're confident. I, I think they, Jim Curtin is, is a good manager uh, and, and they, they believe that they can win it. So be among my colleagues, the, I think they're a top five MLS team, the Philadelphia Union. Good. Thank you. Now, um, and we had one of the players, Ray Gaddis, on, on our match day, uh, you know, the, the outside back, the right back. Right. Because uh, he's Which in. Which high school was Ray from, uh, Vince? Uh, North high school? School, Indianapolis North Central High School. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, he won a state championship. But, uh, Felipe, thank you so much. You know, I'll be honest. Full disclosure, I was really nervous uh, going on, you know, because here you are, former player, and like, oh, gosh, what's he remember? You know, and, and you hopefully you remember some good things. But uh, thank you so much. I, it's, it's refreshing to see a journalist that has knowledge of the game, right, yeah. and you can actually talk the game with, you know, whoever you're interviewing and whatever. It's just I'm sure I don't know how many of your colleagues are in the same boat as you, but – I would think that you're an exception. Well, I, I appreciate the candor, Felipe. And it's actually nice. We've had a lot of people that represent clubs and franchises. And, of course, they have to be – there's a certain uh, cap on what they can and can't say. But but your candor and that and that different insight yeah. is really refreshing. And you've actually reinforced a lot of my positive opinions of the league and, 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 and conceding some of the challenges. So it's nice to hear from somebody so close to it. Um, that, that what we see from the outside is somewhat is somewhat accurate if you look at it closely. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Very much. Thank you for everybody on the other end. And Felipe, I hope we can still stay in touch. And I just got an email from Coach Avery, so hopefully I can have him. Oh, okay, I would love to come on. I mean, I, this is something I tell um, people often. Like my best interviews, the interviews that I enjoy the most, are with coaches. Yeah, uh, because I think that's if you can get them one on one and then you ask the right questions and they and they trust you and they know, OK, this is a soccer guy. He's he's not just a journalist looking for a headline or he's not a guy that covers high school baseball and every once in a while writes about soccer. Uh, you know, the conversations are so enlightening for me as a journalist, because I know that I'm what I'm going to write is going to be at a high level. And, and, and I think, you know, I've had the, the the privilege of working with and interviewing some top managers like Tata Martino, even Frank DeBoer when he, he did struggle here in Atlanta, but still uh, an accomplished player that they live and breathe the game. And and in the case of Tata mm -hmm. Martino, you can see that he, how his strategies play out from the club level to the international level. Uh, and, and those are the interviews that I look forward to the most. So like this type of conversation that we had for me is like, my bread and butter. I could do it all day. I could stay on with you guys forever just talking about it. Yep. yep. No, I could too. Uh, likewise. Um, thank you so much again. Um, give your kids a hug. I'd like to see them, maybe meet them someday, but uh, we'll do. Um, but thank you so much for, for um, helping an old coach out, even though I didn't get the <laughs> chance to really coach you long, but I appreciate you coming on and thank you. Really enjoyed it, Felipe. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank and on Thursday, you. just so you know, Thursday we have Rick Finoglia who, um, did the Manchester United Manchester United 4v4 study. So he's going to share his insight on that. So it'll be interesting. So thank you so much, Felipe. God bless. Keep in touch. Right. Take care, everybody. Thank you, everybody.